boxing news. Ow! Okay, we'll start with this. A series of tweets from none other than the golden boy himself of Golden Boy Promotions, Oscar De La Hoya, who stated, It is very unfortunate Isaac Pitbull Crew's team turned down a very lucrative offer more than he made with Tank. Knucklehead Sean, Sean Gibbons, I'm just trying to make the best and most entertaining fights possible, and you guys are playing games. Where will you make that kind of money that I offered to fight? This is why special attention is going to go into Isaac Cruz's next fight. This is why I feel that that Sean Gibbons, Isaac Cruz, they may have painted themselves into a corner because if Isaac's next fight isn't a high-profile fight, you know what people are going to say. Oscar De La Hoya added, Isaac Cruz, we are ready to make you a very lucrative offer. You're coming off a great performance against a great fighter in Tank. Vamos! Over a week ago, Sean Gibbons said they were going to make Ryan Garcia an offer. Over a week ago, Sean Gibbons was talking about doing that fight, that Ryan Garcia versus Isaac Cruz fight on pay-per-view. Have they made Ryan Garcia that offer? Well, if they have, I ain't heard nothing about it. And if I'm being honest, I don't believe Sean Gibbons. I don't believe they offered Ryan Garcia anything to bring him over to Showtime and fight Isaac Pitbull Cruz there on Showtime. I, I don't believe Sean Gibbons. I can't believe this is the state of the lightweight division just to make a Ryan Garcia versus Isaac Cruz fight. This weekend, Oscar De La Hoya stated I'm working on something huge for Ryan Garcia. And what that huge thing he's working on? What that might be? I don't know. The whole thing is revolting. The whole thing is nauseating for me because... Ryan Garcia is not a world champion, neither is Isaac Cruz. Neither one of them are established cash cows in their divisions either. Ryan has a lot more notoriety by way of social media than Isaac Cruz does, though all the same, that notoriety doesn't make him the cash cow or even a cash cow in the lightweight division. It just doesn't. And we find ourselves in a situation to where making Ryan Garcia versus Isaac Cruz proves difficult. Why? Why the fuck should a fight like that be so hard to make? In my heart of hearts, I feel a few things. One or two things. I'm sick of Ryan Garcia's bullshit. I'm still sick of his bullshit. Though I don't blame him or Golden Boy Promotions in this situation. I firmly believe that Golden Boy Promotions wants to do this fight. And the resistance that we're seeing is coming from the Isaac Cruz side of things. Who perhaps don't want to put him in that Ryan Garcia fight so soon off a loss. A loss. I think the Isaac Cruz people want to slow things down. And I don't think Isaac Cruz is afraid of Ryan Garcia. Ryan's more of a peak than Isaac is. I don't think Isaac himself is afraid of Ryan. I think... What I think is Isaac's management don't want to send him to the zone. It's what I think. I think Isaac's people want to take their foot off the gas coming off that professional loss. They want to fight in some safer fights in their neck of the woods on their side of things. They don't want him to just be an opponent for yet another high-profile name in the lightweight division like Orion Gersha. That's what I think. I think the resistance that we're seeing is mostly coming from the Isaac Cruz side of things, even if Isaac himself isn't afraid of Ryan Garcia. Isaac himself doesn't make those decisions. His management does. And that's what's nauseating about the whole thing. Ryan Garcia versus Isaac Cruz has the potential to be a very commercially successful fight. All of the ingredients are there. But it's not so big a fight that we should be going through all of this. There's not even a world title on the line. And for me, and my money, that's what's nauseating about the whole thing. I mean, how long have we been waiting for Ryan Garcia versus Devin Haney or Ryan Garcia versus Javante Davis or Javante Davis versus Devin Haney? Only for us to have to play the waiting game with this, too. Oscar says he's planning something huge for Ryan Garcia. What that huge thing is, I don't know. I mean, is Ryan Garcia versus Javier Fortuna or Jorge Linares? I mean, what names are out there and what names are out there? Do those names make for huge fights? Look, Garcia versus... This is Jojo Diaz. Is that a huge fight? Kevin Farmer said he's coming back and he's coming back as a lightweight. Is that a huge fight? Garcia versus Farmer? Is that a potential matchup? Is that what Oscar's talking about? I really don't know. I don't know how many huge fights you can make for Ryan Garcia outside of a Javante Davis fight or a Heaven Daney fight or a George Camposos Jr. fight. I really don't know. Like I said, the whole thing is nauseating because it shouldn't be this hard for a guy who's not a champion. It shouldn't be this hard to make a fight and I feel like Ryan Garcia's social media profile, his notoriety, has been more of a hindrance to his career than an asset because that notoriety is a big part of the reason that he's missed a big in the britches. He thinks he's a star already. No, I don't blame him for what's going on with Isaac, but I do blame him for what didn't happen with Devin Haney. I blame him for that because whether he likes it or not, Devin Haney is a world champion and he should be trying to become one himself. 
and he's not. He said the whole goddamn thing's nauseating, and I'm running out of patience for these lightweights. Most of the news you hear coming out of today's lightweight division is in reference to fights that aren't happening. We're just gonna have to wait and see what Oscar's huge news is. Another news in reference to the ongoing legal battle between Terrence Crawford and Bob Arum. Dan Canobio of CompuBox stated, Tim Bradley on the racism allegations brought up by Terrence Crawford towards Top Rank was quoted as saying, In all my years with Top Rank, I've never, ever been mistreated in that fashion at all. Point blank, period. And I'm going to leave it at that. Got another character witness coming forward in defense of Top Rank. Figuratively, of course, since court proceedings haven't started, but Tim Bradley would be the second character witness coming forward in defense of top rank in defense of bob arum rashida ali the daughter of the late great muhammad ali she was the first in association with this case a lot of folks are in their feelings about this thing and i think a lot of folks are confusing bob arum being an asshole with being a racially biased old guy what i think i think they're confusing him being an asshole and not holding his tongue not having any hair on it with being a racially biased promoter i've seen a lot of mention of when Bob Arum called Guillermo Rigondeau a boring fighter who he's going to struggle to get fights for, but... Where's the lie? Guillermo Rigondeau years ago could not get fights with Carl Frampton, could not get fights with Scott Quigg, and could not get fights with Leo Santa Cruz. He did struggle to get fights. Where's the lie? He did struggle to get fights. And a lot of people still characterize Guillermo Rigondeau as being a boring fighter they'd rather not watch because he's boring. What, you think Bob Arum and Top Rank held him back? So it's how come, after they parted way with Top Rank, he didn't all of a sudden become a megastar, a marquee attraction, a marquee fighter. If it was Bob Arum and Top Rank that were holding Guillermo Rigondeau back, why is it that Guillermo Rigondeau didn't go on to be a megastar if Top Rank is to blame? In a nutshell, it's because he's boring. In a nutshell, it's because a lot of fight fans out there don't find his base style aesthetically pleasing. That doesn't lend itself, didn't I should say, lend itself to Rigo's marquee value. And because he had no marquee value, a lot of fighters saw no incentive to fight him. And that doesn't make it okay. No, it doesn't. But I don't think it's okay to accuse anyone of having a racial bias just because they think Rigo's boring. There's been a lot of mention of when Top Rank used to promote Rigo. And how in some ways, Rigo's tenure at Top Rank characterizes the racial bias that Terrence Crawford is describing, but when you think about it... Guillermo Rigondio hasn't been with Top Rank in years, and he's still not a megastar. If Guillermo Rigondio was being held back by Top Rank, why didn't he go on to become a megastar? It's because he's boring. Bob Arum being an asshole doesn't make him a racist. I understand the ethical dilemma with Bob Arum having said what he said about Rigo whilst being his promoter, that he's going to struggle to get fights for him and that he's a boring fighter to watch. But well, after he said that, Rigo did struggle to get fights, and people did still call him boring. I just think that Bob was being an asshole the same way I think he was being an asshole with Terrence Crawford when he said that, you know, he lost money on a lot of his fights. I think that was an asshole thing to say, an asshole thing to do, but I don't think that denotes, characterizes a racial bias. According to Tim Bradley, in all his years at Top Rank, he was never mistreated on the premise of race. Never treated badly by Top Rank in Tim Bradley's own words. And here we see, years after he retired from professional boxing, having been a champion the same way that Terrence Crawford is a champion. He's still working with Top Rank. He is now a commentator for them, part of their analytical team. So if the situation is the way that Terrence Crawford says it is... Why did Rashida Ali come up the bat for Bob Arum? Why is a former world champion in Tim Bradley saying the opposite of what Terrence Crawford is saying? And why is a former champion in Tim Bradley still employed with Top Rank if if the, if the workplace is as inhospitable as Terrence Crawford says it is. As inhospitable for black fighters as Terrence Crawford says it is. And when did Terrence Crawford identify these unethical practices, this racial bias within Top Rank's infrastructure? Was it before or after he re-signed with them? It all looks a certain way. And these are the relevant questions. A lot of guys leave me angry comments saying, I don't know what Bob Arum says behind closed doors. Yeah, but neither do you. So you're in about as much position to speak on it as I am, with the difference being I'm not trying to censor anyone or control what it is they're saying the way some of these very angry individuals out there are. The way you guys are. Attempting to seize and thereby control the narrative by way of guilt trips and poorly thought out arguments. You don't have all the facts, so you shouldn't be talking about it. Well, you don't have all the facts either, but you don't see me trying to control what it is you're saying, what it is you're thinking. I can only tell you what I think, and if you want to know what I think, and you're here, so I'll assume that you do, 
Some of the some of the stuff being brought up about Bob Arum has more to do with Bob being an asshole than Bob being a racist. The examples I'm being given, that is, when he called Guillermo Regandio and Floyd Mayweather Jr. boring, when he stated that he was losing money on Terence Crawford's fights, those were some asshole things to say, which makes them some asshole things to do. But being an asshole doesn't make him a racist, and those eggs are gonna need more bacon. For Terence Crawford to substantiate his case, his case in a court of law. Because in case you missed it, it's a court proceeding we're talking about and whether or not Terrence Crawford can substantiate what it is he's saying. Because if he can't, he is defaming Bob Arum, defaming Top Rank as a company, and slandering them. No, if he's got some kind of damning audio or video. I read the fucking article in the New York Post, though he said bad things about Al Heyman. Yeah, he said bad things about Eddie Hearn. What's your point? Do those two guys look alike? All I'm telling you is it's going to take more to substantiate this case in reference to what's being claimed than what's being presented. Crawford says he's biased towards white and Latino fighters. Because they get preferential treatment. Is that what Mikey Garcia was getting when he sat on the shelf for two years, being represented back then by the same guy that's representing you now, Brian Friedman? Who's seeming more and more to me like an ambulance chaser. Do you think that Brian Friedman would describe Bob Arum's treatment of Mikey Gersha as preferential treatment. All I'm telling you is in a court of law, those eggs need more bacon. This ain't Twitter, and you're not in the comments under somebody's YouTube video anymore. You take this thing to court, you're gonna have to substantiate what you're saying. Otherwise, it's a baseless claim. A baseless claim that sounds a lot like defaming someone's character, which is cause for countersuit. Well, it could be short of some damning audio or video. So let's see if Terrence ain't got that up his sleeve. And finally, reigning WBC featherweight champion Gary Russell Jr. states the pound for pound list is a popularity contest. It's not based upon skill. I think he's right in many instances. When it comes to more popular and publicized periodical pound for pound lists out there, I do think it's a popularity contest. Gary was quoted as saying, what I can say is to the people who had the opportunity to watch me compete, in most cases will say my skill set is special. Russell noted during a recent Zoom media conference call when and asked about his name being absent from pound for pound lists. It's second to none. As far as the pound for pound list, I don't pay the pound for pound list any mind. The pound for pound list is a popularity contest. It's based on who's more popular. It's not based upon skill. If it was based upon skill, Gary Russell Jr. would already be there. My father told me a long time ago, no matter what you do, it won't be enough to please everybody, noted Russell, who was part of the 2008 U.S. Olympic boxing team which competed in Beijing. Somebody always has something to say. All I can do is the best I can do. And I reiterate, I don't disagree with Gary. When it comes to a lot of pound for pound lists that are out there, it's more of a popularity contest than an assessment of skill. And that's how you can explain some of the discrepancies you see on these pound for pound lists. Ring magazines, ESPNs, BoxRex pound for pound list has more to do with an algorithm than a tally of votes, as opposed to the aforementioned pound for pound lists. Ring magazines or ESPNs, they're all the same. Gary's not off base. Most pound for pound lists these days. Yeah, it's a popularity contest. So what you then have to ask is why isn't Gary Russell Jr. more popular? He's the longest reigning champion at this time in the sport of boxing, the longest active reigning world champion in this era. He's also one of the least active. And that doesn't help his case. For a perspective, Canelo Alvarez is often dubbed the cash cow of boxing, and he's a lot more active than Gary Russell Jr. He fought something like, I don't know, four or five times in 12 months, whereas Gary, Gary's been averaging one fight a year for about five or six years now. In fact, last year, he didn't fight at all. I mean, if you're not popular, that's why you're not popular. That is a big part of it as far as popularity contests go. And make no mistake, Gary did hit the nail on the head. The more popular periodicals in their pound-for-pound -pound lists really are popularity contests more than they are assessments of skill. And if you don't see Gary there, it's because Gary's not very popular. If he were, he'd likely have a spot. Gary isn't very popular because Gary isn't very active. We've talked about that, so he's not going to win any popularity contests. Though in terms of skill and a skills assessment, well, Gary's not on my pound-for-pound -pound list for the same reason he's not going to win any popularity contests. Because he's not very active. Coupled with, he's not a unified champion like some of the pound-for-pound -pound alums you find 
on the Ring IQ pound for pound list. He's not a unified champion or a multi weight champion. He's not a very active champion. Essentially, what I'm getting at is even if it's not a popularity contest, even if you are cross comparing the career of Gary Russell Jr. with some other fighters that are ranked on a pound for pound list, say the Ring IQ pound for pound list, Gary doesn't meet the criteria. I'd go as far as saying that. Artur Betterbeev, Stefan Fulton, Stefan Fulton, who fought two champions, two unbeaten champions last year, and became a unified champion at his weight, 122 pounds. Stefan Fulton's got a stronger argument to be ranked on a pound for pound list than Gary Russell Jr. Same as Artur Betterbeev and MJ Akhmadaliev. Gary doesn't have an argument to be ranked as a pound for pound fighter. For a perspective, Canelo Alvarez is the cash cow of boxing. He makes enough money from one boxing match that he can take the rest of the year off if he so chooses, but that's not the kind of schedule that he's been on. So when the cash cow of boxing is regularly getting out there against unbeaten champions, unifying his division, becoming an undisputed champion, and doing so within 12 months, there's no excuse for a fighter like Gary to be as inactive as he is. And it's his prerogative when he wants to fight and how often. That bit of it is his prerogative, though no one is going to think of him as being in the same league as a Canelo Alvarez or a Terrence Crawford, for that matter. Or Usyk, because both him and Terrence Crawford had fights last year. Gary didn't. Terrence Crawford fought Sean Porter in defense of his WBO title, and Oleksandr Usyk became a two-division unified heavyweight champion. What did Gary do? Nothing. Gary is coming up on two years of inactivity. The last time he saw action was before the pandemic shut everything down. He's going to be defending his title against the Philippines' own Mark McSayo later on this month. And the last time he was in action was at the beginning of 2020 against Tuxak Niambiar. The way that breaks down is it's just a few weeks short of two years. Just a few, yeah, though. If you round up, it's two years. I mean, listen, you're not unified. You're not very active. You're not that popular. You're not a pound-for-pound -pound fighter.